And a Dominican found this briefcase unattended, and he was like, I wonder who this is. So he opened the briefcase to find out if there was a name in it. And when he opened the briefcase, there were many documents um, from Freemasonic, Secret Society, uh, signed by Freemasons, addressed to, quote, Brother Bugnini. I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier for Christ. How do we get here? Taylor's going to connect all the nuggets. His book just came out, by the way. The bestseller on Amazon. Terry's been telling everybody about it. So have I. And it's it's the talk of the Catholic Church right now. And the book Infiltration, it's really the plot to destroy the Catholic Church from within. By the way, before I uh, we go on to the next segment, I do also want to t- thank Taylor Marshall and Father Pavone. Taylor Marshall sent a video link to Father Pavone, and uh, this is what Father Pavone wrote. It's, it shows people in an abortion clinic, and they're playing catch, or they're playing with babies that have been aborted. Uh, Father Pavone writes, This, my friends, is what evil looks like. Our own investigation into the abortion industry saw them playing catch with the babies in the hallway. Another investigation saw them playing wishbone with the aborted baby parts. Thank you to Taylor Marshall for the video link. And uh, as Catholics, uh, the worst thing that we're dealing with right now in our country is abortion. We got to put a stop to this prayerfully, actively, and politically. And that's why as a Catholic, you can call me a single-issue voter because I guess I am a single-issue voter. If I lived 150 years ago when people were owning blacks as slaves, guess what? I would have been a single-issue voter. If they would have said, this guy's running for office and this guy's running for office, and this, and both these guys are identical. They're good on all the issues, but this guy believes in slavery. Guess what I would have done? That would have disqualified my vote. If I lived in the time of slavery, I would have been a single-issue voter. I live in the time where they're killing babies every day. I got no problem being a single-issue voter. If you're pro-abortion, you'll never get my vote. I'm not going to stand before Jesus Christ in judgment of that sin. We got Dr. Taylor Marshall, author of Infiltration. Doctor, bring us uh, to the contemporary times. Uh, I want people to buy your book. Uh, Mine is, is arriving today, according to Amazon. I purchase it over the weekend everybody needs to buy this book infiltration we need to become saints we need to live in a state of grace become holy pray our rosaries go to mass as often as possible bring us to the liturgical reforms where we discovered that Annabelle bonini was a freemason talk to us a little bit about archbishop fulton sheen's role in exposing communism uh the infiltration of the priesthood and then uh talk to us about a little bit about the saint gallons mafia in this in this final segment so uh, let's let's begin with Fulton Sheen and Bella Don because um, some people have heard about that. It's good to put it into context and what we're talking about here. So Bella Don was um, she had been a communist agent here in America, and she testified before the United States House Committee on Un-American Activities in 1953, and she talked about the ways that she, as a communist agent, was subversive in America by infiltrating American institutions. Her job was to infiltrate schools for young kids and seminaries. And she says that she and her team put in the 1930s, not the 1960s folks, the 1930s, she put 1,100 men into the priesthood to, and these are her words, in order to destroy the church from within. That's where I get the, the subtitle to my book, Infiltration. Infiltration, the plot to destroy the church from within. So Bella Dodd, before the House of Representatives, is saying we were trying to destroy the church from within in the 1930s. She had a massive conversion through the spiritual direction and influence of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. She converted. She came to the Catholic Church. She confessed. And she did not reveal the identity of these 1100. She did say to Dietrich von Hildebrand, also a very trustworthy source, a man greatly respected in the Catholic Church, that during her time working with the communists, they were in contact with four infiltrator cardinals in Rome. So 
So from her firsthand testimony, we know that she and who knows how many others were infiltrating in America the Catholic seminary. So 1,100 bad seminarians went into to the priesthood in the 1930s and 1940s. It's pretty scary. Taylor, this makes sense to me now because I know that Archbishop Fulton Sheen, he railed against communism, and I was wondering why, I mean, he had, he had a real ax to grind with it. It was not only that it was already infiltrating America, he already knew about the infiltration within the priesthood, so now, now his lectures make sense to me. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. He, he, and he knows, he knew things through the confessional. I mean, not that he could act on them, that's a good, you know, he can't ever reveal it, but he was aware of how um, deep this goes. And again, it's really important for people to see that this is a long game for the enemies of Christ, right? They are willing to be patient to win the ultimate prize, right? So that's what's going on here. So um, what was the second question you want to talk about, Bunini? Yeah, what, uh, I've Terry Barber, my partner, who's off today, he's out in the, uh, doing some apostolic work. Terry actually interviewed uh, one of the last surviving Vatican II experts, his name was uh, uh, Abbot Boniface Lukey. Terry went up north in California. He, lives in, he lived in a monastery. He was the last, uh, one of the final you know, surviving uh, experts at Vatican II. And Terry interviewed him for three hours, and Abbot uh, Boniface Lukey told Terry, it's recorded, that... Uh, Absolutely, that Annabelle Bugnini was the Freemason, and he gave him all the evidence. He was there at Vatican too. He knew them all. They were friends, and this is this is recorded, by the way, by somebody who was at Vatican II who knew Annabelle Bugnini and all the others. And uh, and uh, yeah, it's recorded. But so, but go ahead. What did how did you discover this as well? So um, Annabelle Bugnini, he was a uh, a liturgy scholar, and I'll put air quotes around scholar. He, in 1955, with permission of Pope Pius XII, it be, this project began in 1951, but it was made universal in the church in 1955. They redid the liturgy of Holy Week in the Roman Rite. Now, in the Roman Rite, the most ancient liturgies that we have is the liturgy of Holy Week. So we're talking about Palm Sunday through Easter Sunday. That week right there is Holy Week. That is the most ancient treasure that we have in the Roman Rite. It goes back older than anything else we have. Well, Bunini and others, who I would call infiltrators, wanted to change that. They wanted to update it for modern times. And the pretense for doing that was, hey, we need laity to be more involved in Holy Week because it's so important. And we need to go back to how the early church did it. Now, the irony of that, of course, is this is the oldest liturgy we have on earth. What are you going to go back to that's older than this? So what he did is he, he made up ideas that he thought would be in the early church. And they wanted to remove very subtly things that were related to sacrifice and priesthood. So you'll see in these liturgies that Bunini moves the priest off the altar for prayers and puts them over by a chair. You see this in the current Novus Ordo in almost mm -hmm. every church mm -hmm. on earth. It used to be that the priest said his prayers at the altar because the altar is the footstool of God. So you're standing in front of God. Mm. But that's kind of priestly, you know, like that's, that's like real, real, real priesthood. So he's over on the chair now. So he's more of a presider. He's more part of the community and not representing, you know, the people in Christ right there in that intermediary role at the altar. Got it. I um, see that. He added some, yeah, he added some vernacular. He um, added the um, the people— uh, saying their vows, um, their baptismal vows into the Easter vigil. Uh, he shortened the, and removed a lot of the prayers on Palm Sunday. He shortened the gospel reading, um, the, that really long gospel reading. Well, it was even longer. It had much more in it of the, of the passion mm. of Christ. So, he, and in the book, I, there's more changes too, but they're not real radical, but they're gradual. And so in 1955, they just did it to Holy Week, and it was accepted. It was, there was outcry. Some people didn't like it, but it was basically accepted. And Bunini is on record saying, look, once we have the Holy Week and we tried that and it was received, then we could be more aggressive. So beginning in 1962, there is a movement to change not just Holy Week, but all the liturgy all year long. And that begins what becomes in 1969 
the Novus Ordo Mise, the new order of the Mass. And in fact, by the time you get to Paul VI, the liturgies for all seven sacraments are entirely rewritten. So all new stuff. And hey, but I've heard was, I've heard your partner Tim Gordon say. Uh, I think it was I think it was Tim, or it may have been uh, uh, Christopher Hitchborn, that uh, if you look at a Masonic service, a Masonic like a liturgy, there's you can see that there's some similarities between a, a Masonic uh, service or liturgy. And uh, a lot of what Bonini put in the Novus Ordo Mass. Have, have you ever read anything like yeah, that? I think correct. it was Tim yeah. Gordon so, or Christopher so Hitchborn pushing, that told me that. So pushing the table out and then making the chair a really important. I mean, before Vatican II, the chair, I mean, there was the bishop's uh, cathedra, his, his throne. But um, the chair was not like this major liturgical center point. And it becomes mm-hmm. that under Bonini. And, and you also see this in Freemasonic architecture. But... Bugnini was the chief architect. He's the one who did all this. Um, he was the one that was tasked by originally Pius XII when he was very sick, and I explained that illness and how the whole thing works out. And then under Ron, uh, John the Twenty Third, Ron Collin, and under Paul the Sixth, Montini. And the crazy, you know, story that we hear, and this has been testified to by many people, and I document in the book, is that Bugnini was in a meeting, and he left his briefcase behind after this meeting. He forgot it. And a Dominican found this briefcase unattended, and he's like, I wonder who this is. So he opened the briefcase to find out if there was a name in it. And when he opened the briefcase, there were many documents um, from Freemasonic secret society uh, signed by Freemasons addressed to, quote, Brother Bugnini. And this became a major scandal in Rome, and so shortly after this, Pope Paul VI um, sent him away from Rome into exile. He demoted him, and he made him the pro nuncio of to Iran, um, which basically means he's not doing anything. And um, and and that and there he went. So Bunini is influenced by the the secular humanist goals. I mean, the priest faces the people. Everything is now circular and closed in as opposed to like the transcendent where the priest is facing with the people to the crucifix, you know, like the altar is the footstool of God. So there's, there's a different emphasis that Bugnini is bringing into the mass. And uh, unfortunately, this uh, became mainstream. Taylor, we got about two minutes. Um, can you tell people how to get a hold of your book? And uh... yeah, you can. Yep. The, the, book, the book is available. Uh, Sophia Institute is the publisher, and um, it's it's been a number one bestseller in Catholicism for in the UK and Canada and America. It's, it's really just flying off the shelves, and unfortunately, we weren't ready for that demand. So Amazon is back ordered. It says as of today about a month, but uh, we've, we're printing more. Sophia is printing more, and Sophia is shipping copies now. They have some, so if you want to get it quicker go to Sophia Institute Press, and if you ordered on Amazon, I'm told they should, there are, people are getting their books, and they are starting to ship back into stock, so uh, unfortunately, I mean, it's a good problem to have, because people are interested. I think the book is is helpful to people, because it puts things into context in a bird's eye view, and it doesn't just blame one event or one person, but shows the arc of how we got into this ecclesiastical mess. Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity.